Hello and welcome back to Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. I'm your host, Brad Wilder. We've got a great show lined up today. Uta Hagen is back. She is a, a trans widow who has, um, well, gone through quite the experience. To tell us more, John Euler is here to help us get into this issue and um, really this issue of not only the trans movement, but Uta's story as well. And we're going to uh, delve deep into what really was to become of not only her ex-husband, but also how Uta had to really bounce back herself mentally, physically, and emotionally, and, and what that really did for her. So, John, um, welcome back. Take it away, buddy. You've got uh, a great interview lined up for today. Well, thank you, as always. Um, it is our distinct privilege uh, to have Uta back. Uh, she is uh, she's an expert, unfortunately, in this because she is a trans widow. And that means she is one of those that are on the front line of still reeling from the ultimate betrayal. And the one thing that is not talked about is not discussed. And so we are here to feature Uta and her story on behalf of countless women, countless wives and children that have suffered from the abject selfishness of very deviant men that decided that their own deviant pleasure and their own supposed happiness was more important than doing the right thing. So, Uda, welcome back. We're going to pick up where we left off. You're going to be back with us, I think, on multiple occasions into the future because this is, in my estimation, one of the primary issues that no one is talking about, which is the key issue, which is how the trans movement is wreaking havoc on families and you have lived through it. So I recommend people uh, go back and uh, watch part one because we're picking up at this point. Uda, you were describing what you went through. You had an experience with a psychologist that really destroyed you and your family because of the advice. She was suggesting all sorts of things, but Pick up where you want to, whether wherever we left off, but let's continue with your story. First, I do want to recommend you are an author, right? So uh, we have in the curated curated woods. Uh, <laughs> describe for the audience, uh, Uta, about that book. I highly recommend it. It's very compelling, and it has your own photography in it. Yes. It's subtitled True Tales from a Grass Widow. I used the antique term grass widow to go under the wire <laughs> because of, or, or under the radar, I should say, vis-a-vis um, -vis the trans activists. So even how I titled my own story, I was afraid to put trans widow in the title because I thought uh, after, in the aftermath of Abigail Schreier's book at first being banned, her book Irreversible Damage at first was banned by the power of that ideology from being sold on Amazon and other venues and then it was restored. So I think, I think we are in, um, and a time of reexamination that it has to do with some lawsuits coming forward with detransitioners. Um, one day I would love to see a class action lawsuit of us trans widows against the American Psychological Association because of the lies that they promote about us. And um, one of the things that I, uh, I'm often asked, actually, is how could you not have known? Uh, and they'll, they'll make an assumption based on the, the fact that I was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin, a, a liberal college town, that I must have been in some kind of open marriage or I knew about my husband's uh, cross-dressing or something like that. And the fact is, uh, no, I'm, I'm from a rather traditional family and we got married. I'm just going to show you a picture just because I get trolled sometimes and uh, I will be accused of making all of this up. 
<laughs> and well, so, Joe, that is a classic tactic used yes. by the trans activists. They'll just say big whopping lies. So there you are. That we are was kind of your crazy. husband. That was my husband. This was 1978. He was 23. I was 21. This is at the reception, the context in which we met each other, the folk dancers. And so we had this really sort of healthy, wholesome um, setting in which we met. And then later, <laughs> we had our uh, older son. And then I think in this picture, I'm actually pregnant with this one, right? And I do this because um, I believe that I have a right to every photo from my past whether or not my ex-husband was in it in his so-called dead name. That's my past. And I have a right to name him as my ex-husband and, and him. And, I mean, I, I was caused during the divorce to have to say my spouse and to have to say all these neutral things and, and to compel you know to say my my ex-husband she or you know it's like you know linda see that that's another thing talk about adding insult to injury this whole thing is so egregious well the the, the, su the suffering that you have gone through and other trans widows and the kids it's unbelievable yes well i i am uh i have quite a series now on my youtube channel which is in fact, how do people name. find that how do people it's find your YouTube channel? You go to the YouTube search line and you put in Uta, U-T-E, my, my first name of my pen name, and Hagen, H-E-G-G-E-N, and that's the name of the channel. And so um, we have to use pseudonyms. I am running through the female uh names of Shakespeare. I've got Juliet and Ophelia and Portia and now I have a Rosalia. She didn't like Rosamond. So, but I, these stories go on and on and there are patterns. Um, our experience has really not been studied by the sociologists or the psychiatrists, psychologists. They, our, our uh, experiences and what happens with us has not been documented. Um, and they, uh, they minimize the shock of it. I mean, you know, obviously if someone uh, finds out that their husband has a whole other family and that their husband is a bigamist, then uh, society has some sympathy and compassion for you that how could he do? How could he betray you? How could he engage in this deceit? And if you ask me, it's the same kind of deceit with a man who is ideating a female persona for himself and uh, acting on that and having a secret life that is outside of the family and typically spending a lot of money. Now, well, uh, as a therapist, I will make the case that it is twice as hurtful. Not only was your husband having an affair, meaning having sex outside the marriage, but with another man. So here you thought, based upon what he told you, how he presented himself and what he sold to you is true. It was not only the polar opposite, but it was inverted and twisted. So you're, you're left reeling. Talk about a right and a left hook. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I'll just, I'll just go back to the time period when I was pregnant the second time with one little seemingly innocuous lie that he started saying in front of me, I think, maybe as a test to how much I could possibly be gaslit, right? And um, uh, he started lying openly in front of me and our little son um, that he was about three or four years older than he really was. So he was saying that he was 39, um, and then he would get all these compliments from whoever it was that we were getting introduced to. And... And because uh, they would say, oh, you, you're really in great shape, you know, for 30. I never would have guessed you were 39. And I remember, you know, going home with him and saying, why are you saying that? Because everybody knows I'm two years younger than you and I'm not 37. I, you know, this is what are you doing? Right. And of course, 
I never, I never got any kind of apology for that. He, he stopped it. Um, and then uh, I think this, this um, business about not knowing really what he was doing when he was off on his own, um, as far as, you know, sexual peccadillos and that kind of stuff, which he he's never came, uh, you know, honest with any of that. But my discovery, I think you'll you'll have a very interesting interpretation for what happened. That was my discovery. Uh, he had gone on what he said was a business trip from where we lived in Brooklyn, New York, to San Francisco and spent a week supposedly at a conference at San Francisco. Maybe he was at a conference in San Francisco. Maybe there was something, but I look back on some of these so-called business trips and I just wonder. Um, but he came back uh, and, and uh, we were meeting, this was the summer of 1992, about August 20th or something like that. I can remember this because three days later, my older sister's daughter got married in Madison, Wisconsin. So this is this, you know, I'm so, uh, you know, it's sort of like you you start talking about this and, and, and it's so much stuff that you don't know how, where to begin. There you go. Like, and Uta, that's a part of PTSD. So people need to understand yes. the trans widows have been hit with such a tsunami that they... They yes. literally will have a form of PTSD, so you're doing fine. It's yes. all starting to come back. Yes, yes. Well, I, I got full-blown with the panic attacks and all that stuff as time went on, but um, which I'm much better from with all of my schedule of healing outside work and movement and things and walking. But um, so, so we, I had brought the children on the train. They were one and four. I was still breastfeeding our one-year-old. I schlepped them out from uh, New York to Chicago on the train. His parents were living in a high-rise apartment near the lake, near Lincoln Park in Chicago. And he comes back to Chicago from this week in San Francisco. And I noticed right away, as soon as he walked in the door, that he shaved off all of his body hair. He sh it's summer. You know, he's wearing short sleeves. He shaved off all of the hair on his arms. And he had this kind of, I liked the hair on his arms. He had this red hair kind of coarse and, um, you know, and, and his legs and his chest, right? And I'm, I'm there with my in-laws. You know, like I feel like maybe he thought about this. When am I going to do this? And it'll be when she can't say something because we have this other audience. And I feel like, wow, I just should have been not this Scandinavian reserved person that I was raised to be with my Norwegian, by my Norwegian mother. I should have been some kind of more, you know, expressive <laughs> vocal person who would have said in front of the in-laws, what's this? Look at this. Why are you? <laughs> but I didn't. I waited until, you know, we were getting ready for bed and I saw when he changed his shirt, I saw that he had also shaved off his chest. And I said, what were you doing in San Francisco? And he said, none of your business. That's a whole nother level of manscaping, if I must say. I, uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I can't imagine. Um, I don't know why, but uh, I guess to certain individuals, um, that might be a place where some of this starts. It's it's almost a fetish in a sense. It starts not only as a sexual deviance, but it also starts out as a fetish. And I think that part of this is, it's new, it's fresh, it's something I haven't done before. It's intriguing, it's enticing, it's, I feel different and I, you know, it's weird. And, you know, when I, when I see or hear these stories, you know, there, I think there's a difference between being flamboyant, dressing up and going out and performing drag shows to being transgender and living the role in a totally different sexually deviant way. And that's, you know, we said we wouldn't bring that word up today, but I have to because I believe <laughs> that 
and John and I have had this discussion many times that there is a deviance to this all, and it it it, it comes from a it comes from almost a stepping stone of this intrigued me, this kind of trying this was well weird, but it felt kind of good. I kind of felt different, and then it becomes oh, I want to try that next step. What's the next step after that? What's the next? And it just it progresses into obviously where your husband, ex-husband, pardon me, uh, ended up at. Um, a really well, compelling story. I think we're about uh, about halfway through this episode. So I'll just give you a heads up on that. And um, please, John, take it, uh, take it to where you need it to go next because I think we've really got a, a clear understanding of, of what's happened to Uta this far. But there's so much more to tell. Well, the shot, what's compelling, first of all, people need to understand that the term deviance is an actual term often used in sex offender treatment. So when dealing with men who have offended, so if somebody is offended by the term deviance, then um, it's your own issue. If this makes you uncomfortable using precise terminology, then I'm sorry, but you either need to learn what's behind all of this or you probably don't like us talking about this for a reason. So the shock, Uda, as you found out, and I think you're probably exactly right, these guys, the more they, and there's a close parallel, though have men cross-dressed uh, through the eons? Of course they have, but what you will find is they become deviant, and that means twisted, and ultimately it's driven to have an effect upon someone. I love how you described it. He was testing the boundaries. He was gaslighting you, which is another way of saying he's overriding or getting you to override your intuition, which is another way of saying, well, I know what it looks like, but it's really not that. Right. Well, see, um, I said to him, I, I kept, you know, and, and the thing is we had our kids there. We were in our in-laws apartment. It's, it's not like I really have the opportunity to confront him about this um, in a, in a way that I could get information or anything, you know, and, and his parents acted like they didn't notice. I, you know, I don't understand that. It was summer. He was wearing shorts. I, you know, I, I felt like going up to them and saying, have you had your eyes checked recently? You know, but then what happened is, so we went through a couple of uncomfortable days and, you know, we're trying to have this, nice time with the children this is supposed to be a vacation <laughs> and we're taking the kids to the lincoln park zoo and you know uh and i'm and and the thing is um what goes through my mind then is okay you know this is my husband we have had intimacy recently what who was he hanging with? With whom was he hanging out in San Francisco? And I'm still nursing the baby. Could he be exposing me to AIDS? Could I possibly pass this virus to our child through my breast milk? Now that's, you know, you just, like, how can you even remain standing when you start having this thought? Uh, and that's, that's where those of us that aren't in your shoes, weren't in your shoes, Uta, we're not going to comprehend the implications, the, the multiple implications of when you find out that not just a spouse has been unfaithful, but is starting to get into a deviant lifestyle. Right. And so um, I couldn't get any answers out of him. And... Um, then I had an opportunity to look through what was in his suitcase. And he had taken the kids and with my mother-in-law, they had gone out to uh, the playground while I was finishing packing up. And he said, <laughs> uh, my stuff is already packed. You don't need to put anything or open my suitcase. And I just thought, you know, we have little kids, there's a diaper, there's this, there's that. I have the kids and my clothes all mixed up and, you know, we're trying to make our older one carry his own little backpack and, you know, uh, help and everything like this. And I, and I was like, okay, this suitcase is Pandora's box. And at the same time, 
my now ex-father-in-law, uh, Nettie's father, is in the apartment in his office because he had a home office and he was a freelance writer. And so I'm not alone, right? I can't scream and cry if I find something in that suitcase, right? <laughs> and it's sort of like, I think in a way, my Scandinavianness, my reserve that I was taught by my Norwegian mother actually did not serve me well because I think I should have screamed and cried when I found the three diaries, which were sketchbooks written in his unique printing. And I just, it was, it was like a scene in a movie. I took them out of the suitcase. I just felt around and then I felt these uh, things that were not clothes and I pulled them out and they were mostly full. So you calculate in your head how much time must have, have taken. I'm just paging through them and and seeing that he's been going out into Greenwich Village, dressed up as a woman, accepting drinks from men. Um, this name Ruth is written, I'm going to tell Ruth this and this, and I felt so much better when I put on this color, and I'm thinking about and, and then he said a lot of uh, resentful things about me and the kids. So I was just, I actually had, not that I have ever been seriously suicidal. However, in my head, this we're on the 34th floor of a Chicago high rise. In my head, I had this vision of myself falling through the air from the 34th window. And it wasn't that I was ideating my suicide or I was trying to, you know, think of how I might do something like that, but it was a symbolic death of my identity. And I now I understand it looking back more than I did at the time. It was almost like having a waking nightmare. And you've just spoken to the, the traumatic impact. I was just thinking probably the it's equivalent to, though different, but to be a parent of a child, an adult child, even a teen, has committed a heinous crime. Uh, you, know, you you are associated with this person, but again, being a, a, a spouse of someone, your entire life is wrapped up with this person. Mm -hmm. So the person that you thought you knew, suddenly you don't know. You see all these deviant things that is unfolding in front of your face as far as you're leafing through this. It's everything from the degree of deception to, I don't know this person, to look at what he actually says about me. Yeah. To your entire world. It'd be one thing if he came home and said, I'm gonna, I want to get a divorce. That would be hard enough. Mm-hmm. But now to find out that the person you thought you knew is totally different on top of everything else, it just gets overwhelming. And so it's actually it's very much in a moment of time, it's a living death. What do you do? How do you comprehend that your world now is going to be not just turned upside down, but inverted? Because how do you tell people? What do you do? What do you tell the kids? How do you make sense of this? I can only imagine what went through your mind. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, and my there is my father-in-law in his office, <laughs> and, you know, he's, he's the man who beat his son with a belt for laughing in the back seat or for, stra you know, strange things. I knew this from both Nettie and his younger sister, that their father was quite violent. I knew their father as a as a socially awkward man now looking back and with a lot of special education training i do wonder if if nettie's father was on the autism spectrum um so uh you know i'm i'm just wondering how long how much more we have um brad <laughs> because i can sort of wrap this up or i could continue with <laughs> we have about oh. five minutes left okay this, so, this half of this episode yeah good okay thanks um so uh what i did was i i took the books i thought i have to have some way of keeping one of these or something i need to have this 
for me. And I, and I knew where a neighbor of theirs lived, a woman from South Africa, that I thought might she lived like on a lower floor maybe five floors down and i knew which apartment i had been there um and i thought maybe as a woman maybe just as a woman that she would have some sympathy for me even though she was a friend with that family and so i i took the books i went down there and knocked on her door and i explained what happened and i showed her these notebooks and um i said can you just please keep one of them? Can you mail it to my parents' address? Because I think I'm going to have to get divorced, and uh, I think I'm not going to be able to have proof of this. Um, and I, uh, and she gave me a glass of water, <laughs> and then she said, "Well, I'm friends with this family, and I really." I can't do something like that. And so I just, I felt, wow, I'm, I feel so betrayed by the sisterhood, like, wow. <laughs> and so I, I went back upstairs, you know, took the elevator back upstairs and uh, put the books back where they were and then, uh, you know, got ready to get on the bus up to Madison to have the celebration of my niece's wedding and so I'm I didn't tell Nettie that I found the things I I waited until that evening after we had gotten the kids to sleep and um, and his reaction was anger how dare you go in into my things how dare you those are my private things and just just like a guy that's busted with pornography Right? Either, what? I didn't do it. Why are you looking over my shoulder? Why are you? It's that defensiveness that women need to be mindful of. Yeah. Right? Because it, it makes all the difference in the world. If there's any hope, a guy will appear shocked, of course, that he's suddenly busted, but he'll be broken and contrite. If a guy doubles down, becomes more hardened, and starts to project, that that's one of the telltale signs of advanced degrees, as it were, of deviance. So, Uda, hold that thought. We're going to bring this episode uh, to a close. We're going to pick it up at this point on the next um, edition of this uh, this important uh, episode, because you're speaking, no doubt, to people that have never thought about this, because the media has been so complicit in really painting these deviant men as the martyrs, as the victims. These are, you know, it's really misplaced sympathies. When the sympathies need to be, our sympathies need to be on the wives who are now left abandoned, betrayed, reeling, and their kids. This is the ultimate betrayal, and these men are moral cowards and they're deviant because they have left their families and there will be a lifetime of carnage in terms of emotional fallout. We're going to pick it up at this point when we uh, meet again on the next episode. Will you stay with us? There you have it. That's our first half with Uta Hagen. Um, she's a trans widow who is telling her story so bravely um, to us here on Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. I'm your host, Brad Wilder, episode or part two is on the way. I hope you can tune in for that. She's got uh, a, a really graphic story to tell you about how this has affected the kids. Obviously, the, the whole story so far has been graphic and, um, uh, you know, it really does expose what's, what's really going on in the real world today in a lot of families' houses. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.